So I'm going to be reading day two of Be Not Far From Me. I hope you've read the first two chapters. And here with me is Clyde. He's my, my reading buddy for as long as he will last. Okay, here we go. Day two. I wake up to pain. My foot rubs with each push of my heart, which I can't imagine means anything good. And I'm freezing. No, I correct myself. Knowing that once I start using words like that, I might have to learn a hard lesson about the difference between being cold and actually dying from it. That's what freezing is, and I'm not dead. Nope, I agree with myself. A few winters ago, we had what the TV weathermen called a polar vortex. It was so cold, you had to bring your car battery indoors with you if you wanted to go anywhere in the morning. And you didn't go outside unless it was worth maybe not coming back in. We didn't have school for a week, and of course, I managed to drop my phone in the toilet, so I was caught up from Meredith and Kavita and do sure as if I died anyway. But my dad didn't raise any pansies, so when the garbage can got full, I figured it wasn't so cold that a person couldn't burn trash. Our cupboards were low, and we'd been eating tuna for two days, so the trash can had a funk about that filled up the whole trailer about it, sorry. I was done with smelling it, done with staying inside, and done with people on TV telling me I couldn't go outside. So I bundled up, same as I would in any cold, grabbed some matches, and went out to burn the barrel. The wind cut through my clothes like I might as well have been naked, and by the time I reached the barrel, I knew I'd made a bad decision. But I was barely out there, and I wasn't leaving a garbage bag with rotting tuna scraps in the yard. We might be poor, but we weren't trash. The first match I tried to strike flew out. My fingers were already numb when I went for the second one. Fumbling and stupid, I dropped it. My legs were aching when I pulled the third, a steady thrum that had started at my feet and crawled to my knees, already stiff and locked against the wind. I realized too late what was happening and turned back to the trailer, only to fall flat on my face into the snow. My legs were useless, dead sticks attached to a living body that wasn't going to be that much longer if I didn't figure some shit out. Past. I managed to get back up, forcing my feet, so heavy, so awkward, to move by sheer willpower. I made it about 10 yards before red filled my vision, and I went down again, a little oof coming out of my mouth that blew up snow in a tiny blizzard in front of my face. No mattress had ever been so comfortable as that snow, and I had never been so tired in my life as I had been in that moment. I've heard that drowning people hear singing, and then have a moment of calm before the end. I don't know if it's the same for everyone that's almost frozen, but I saw cans of tomato soup. Meredith laughed when I told her that, but Kavita got quiet and looked at me hard. Why did you see soup, she asked, her intensity drawing Meredith's attention away from trying out new braids in my hair. I don't know, I had. Shrugged, body still sore from the experience. I guess maybe I knew I wasn't going to make it, and my brain wanted to give me a good thought. Let me think of something warm to make me feel better as I went out. Tomato soup was the best it could come up with. One nice memory I still have of my mama before she split. She wasn't much of a cook, but she really can't screw up tomato soup. So that was a winter weather meal at our house, complete with grilled cheese that dad usually did because mamas tended to be burnt. Dad spotted me lying in their side yard, seeing lines of soup cans that weren't there. He hauled my ass inside and put me in front of the kerosene heater until I unfolded my limbs, each one of them still shaky and weak. We couldn't really afford the copay on our insurance unless one of us was bleeding out, so he just did what made the most sense to him for someone with hypothermia. Kept me warm and fed me chicken broth. I slept forever once I found the couch, maybe could have even faded on out if Dad hadn't kept waking me up to ask me if I was alive. I was alive then, I'm alive now. So I know I'm not freezing and here under the tree because I sure as hell haven't seen any tomato soup and if I did, you can be damn sure I'd have eaten it already. I'm not starving either, that's the other thing. I'm hungry, which means I'm fine. I've gone a day or two without food in my life. I always point out like I'm on a diet or something when I show up to lunch without anything to eat. Meredith would make a joke, say she's getting chubby anyway and slip me half her sandwich. I try not to eat it in three bites, really focus on not tearing into that bologna and cheese like it was the best thing that had ever happened to me. But sometimes it would be because dad wasn't getting any overtime. Meredith might be dumb, but she's not stupid. 
there's a difference. She was always watching, and if I went a couple of days on one of my so-called diets, she'd have me over for the weekend and ordering everything from pizza to Chinese to the one questionable Thai place that's totally run by a white guy. So I'm not starving, I say aloud, breaking up the memory of Meredith and piles of food, because while I'm grateful to her and always will be, thinking of that food and not having it in front of me hurts. No, I'm not freezing and I'm not starving. And I know both these things are true because I'm in pain. When you can't feel anything is when you need to worry. My foot doesn't look any better in sunlight. The day snuck up slow and I watch it come along with a mama raccoon leading her babies back to their den. The smallest one stopping to pick up things with its little hands. It turned over a few sticks just to see what was under them. Then its mama came back for it, rounded it up with the brothers and sisters, and the little family fell out of my sight. Those things are so cute, you've got to remind yourself that they're actually nasty little bastards that'll turn kittens into pieces while they're still alive just to get to the tasty bits. It's a good reminder that my own tasty bits are hanging out of my foot, so I crawl out from under the spruce once daylight is full on. My foot is wrinkly from having a wet sleeve wrapped around it all night, the skin pulling back from the wound even further. I have to tug on the sleeve harder to take it off than I did to put it on, so I must be swelling. Everything looks clean, but I know by the time I can see an infection, it'll be ready, already too late. The sun gets high enough that I can feel warmth from its rays, so I strip down, taking everything off. I throw my clothes over branches and let the breeze do the rest while I sit, hunched and naked on a down tree. My skin is mottled red and white, the sun not doing enough against the chill of the wind. I look like marble, blood and flesh instead of rock and mineral, and I wonder if anyone were to come along, if I'd yell for help or ask them to admire me for a minute first. It's funny, and I laugh again, wondering if this is part of the process of losing it, which is something I don't get to do. I don't get to because I thought about my situation while I lay in the moonlight under the tree and realized not only did I get left behind, but also no one's coming to look for me either. Dad's pulling a double shift and then crashing at a buddy's, probably pulling in more pay if he can, and headed right back to the factory after grabbing a few hours of sleep. I can assume my friends thought I headed for home and somebody picked up my pack for me, my phone buried deep underneath layers of clean underwear, and more than likely dead by now. Whoever took my stuff might drive it over to the house and leave it there for me, not thinking anything of the fact that I'm not home. If Dad's there and awake, there might be a conversation where two and two get split together, but I can't count on that. To be honest, Luke's probably the one who would have thought to grab my gear, and I doubt he's in any hurry to come face to face with me or anyone I've vaguely related to anytime soon. I give it three days, maybe more, before connections are made and everyone realizes I'm still in the woods. I look at my foot, turning it different ways in the morning light. I don't think I have that much time. On a good day, I can put in eight miles on the trail. I assume I will not be having a good day, but I do know not having shoes isn't the setback it seems. More than once, I've been on trails with people who put a lot of money into serious boots, not realizing that their leg has the job of lifting that extra two pounds on each foot with every step. And that adds up, taking them down by midday and draining them empty by nightfall, if they don't give up and turn around. I'll take my shoes off when I'm hiking if the trail is clear, loving the freedom of dirt in between my toes. So my one good foot being there isn't too much of an issue. It's the other one I need to come up with a solution for. I tear it back into my shirt and once it's dry, biting a tiny puckered hole with my canines that I widen with my fingertip. Then I push my whole finger through. I rip up a section from the bottom as wide as my hand and loop one end over my right arm and let the other end dangle near my ass. It's not easy, but I get my bad foot up and hook it through the other end, looking back over my shoulder and inching the makeshift sling down to my ankle. It's not bad. My heel is practically touching my butt, and my knee will be screaming in a few hours. But the wound is out of the dirt, and I don't have to waste... Oops. I don't have to waste a bunch of energy holding my leg up. The next thing I need is a goal. When my family... When my familiarity with punching got me kicked off the basketball team and that suggested the non-confrontational sport of cross country, I was less than enthused. I wanted to be in it, fighting for something, swinging elbows while I grappled for the ball. 
My attitude must have been obvious on the first day of practice because coach pulled me aside and told me I looked like I wanted to fight somebody. I told him maybe I did. And what the hell kind of competition is there in running? Competition? Coach had asked, pushing his hat back off his forehead. Okay, tell you what, smartass. Give me three miles, then come back and see what kind of fight you've got left in you. I had shit left, but I took his point. My opponent was myself, the very deep pain that welled within me from mile one, the only thing I had to overcome to keep going. I couldn't run the whole three, puked twice, and got back to coach with swollen feet and a blister the size of my ass on one heel. He pulled me off the ground, settled my palms on top of my head so I could take deeper breaths and said, tomorrow, try harder. Coach saw me for who I was right from the beginning. Someone who wasn't going to back down from that kind of an insult. So I came back the next day and tried harder and the next, pushing past pain to the runner's wall where the only things that exist are your feet, the ground and a point in the distance. Which is exactly what I need right now, a point in the distance. Today you're going to walk two miles in one direction, I say aloud, making it official. There is no response, not even that one chatty squirrel, just the wind taking my words. I didn't make a fire last night, but I've got to leave something behind so that if anyone's looking for me, they'll know I was here and where I went after. I gather enough stones to form an arrow, pointing the direction I'll be headed once I set out. The first bit of luck to find me comes in the form of a walking stick I spot nearby, with a notch at just the height of my armpit. It's not a perfect crutch, but perfection's pretty far from reach since I haven't eaten in 24 hours and I'm currently a free bleeder. I tuck it under my arm, leaning gingerly forward to see if it'll support my weight. It does, and I take first one hop, then another. I'm hunched like an old woman and swearing like an old man, but I'm moving. All right, Ashley Hawkins, I say, squaring my shoulders as best as I can while using a crutch. Go be a badass. And with that, I inch forward. Water will always follow the path of least resistance, something I don't have the luxury of doing. It will split around rocks, make turns to avoid tree roots, then head back to the other way like maybe left the stove on a home. And while this makes for a lovely postcard, it is a bitch of a thing when you need to head in one direction but stay hydrated at the same time. That has always been part of the fact that I know which way I'm pointed, no matter where we go. He says people these days are so stupid they couldn't find north if their nose was magnetized. And from what I've seen on the trails, this is somewhat true. My innate sense of direction has always been a point of pride for me, and more than once I've had to correct Duke about which path to take in order to reach where we were headed. Granted, it's easy to lose your bearings. Most make the excuses because everything looks the same in the woods, but that's like saying we're all pink on the inside. If you pay attention, there's as much difference between one tree and the next as there is in people. I know I won't end up, wa up walking in circles for these reasons. I know which way I'm pointing and I'll pay attention to everything I pass. What can happen though and will is that no matter how hard I try to walk in a straight line west, which should be the shortest route out of here, I'm going to pull to the south because I'm leaning that way due to my injury. And it's impossible to walk in a straight line in the woods anyway, for the same reason blue lines of water on maps are curvy messes. A down tree, a slippery ledge, a scree that could go out from under me with no warning. If I see these things, I'll avoid them, which means going off one way or another, never quite sticking to true west. I know how to make a shadow stick, a nifty trick involving the morning sun, and a decent sized stick jammed in the ground sundial style. You mark the end of the shadow, wait a bit, then mark where the shadow has moved to and bisect those two lines, and your new line is pointing east-west. I can course correct every morning if I need to, but a shadow stick only works if the sun is out, and I'll be adding miles every time I go around and any, any obstacle that points me anywhere other than west. Miles mean time, and that's something I don't have. I also don't have water, something that's more of a problem than I want to admit. It's there, for sure, in all the little ravines and little places where the water goes. I know better than to touch still water. Anything placid can get warm, cooking all kinds of bacteria, and who knows what else in its depths. Moving water I will drink, and one of those would lead me to a stream, and I could follow that to something bigger, which would eventually take me to civilization. 
If I had food and wasn't hurt, it might be the smart choice. But those little trickles of water will take their time getting to where they're going, leading me through switchbacks and big looping curves that will drain all my energy. It's what dad would call the scenic route, and I don't have time to appreciate nature when it's trying to kill me. The shortest distance between two points is a straight line, so I'm going to make one as best as I can and find water along the way. It's late spring, so it shouldn't be too much of a problem. The rain that I was cursing last night will be my saving grace today, so I hobble down to run in water when my path crosses with it, but I don't follow the siren call of its bubbling voice. I've been moving for about three hours when I decide it's time to go down to the water I can hear on the other side of the ridge I'm climbing. It's slow moving, my hoping, my hopping forward and grabbing for trees while trying not to lose the walking stick. I go down twice, once on my stomach, knocking out my wind and sending the bitter taste of bile into the back of